Someone once defined compassion, and I'm not exactly uh, sure who it was or where I even came across it, but someone once properly defined compassion as your pain in my heart. Your pain in my heart. Or, to put it the reverse, my pain in your heart. It's the ability to be able to feel with and for other people in the midst of their struggles. And there was really no one that ever embodied this more <clears throat> than Jesus. That's why so many times I, I prefer the, the King James rendering of, of these texts where it says he was moved with compassion. More modern translations will say moved with pity or something along those lines. And uh, I don't know that it's a bad translation. I just pref wish the word would have been compassion uh, when it was translated in more modern uh, renderings. And he's constantly exhibiting compassion toward other people. And then when I think about that, I think about, uh, of course, you see that in his miraculous ministry. He's helping people. That's when many times, not every time, but most of the time, he's being moved with compassion to help people. And it reminds me of what one of my teachers in school used to say a lot when he would talk to us about different things. He taught us a lot on uh, a lot of classes. Uh, every quarter you have a class preacher in his work, which is really down-to-earth, practical ministry. Uh, and he was just an exceptional teacher and uh, truly loved. He, he taught us to truly love the church and to love people and, and that uh, people were to be treated with dignity and respect and to be served in a way that honored Jesus. But he used to say to us something quite often, and he said, I always found it interesting that when Jesus chose to verify his identity on earth, that is, to verify his identity, miracles, that's one of the purposes of miracles, was to prove who Jesus was. He said, I always found it interesting that when Jesus chose to verify his identity on earth, he used the means of helping people to do it. He used the means of helping people to do it. Now, he could have done it the way the devil tempted him in Matthew chapter 4 and said, go up to the top of the temple, jump down, and be rescued and make this big, grand public spectacle, and everyone will be drawn to you. But he didn't. He went to the lowliest of lows, and he went to people that society had cast out, and he felt their pain, and he healed them, not just physically, but <clears throat> emotionally. And so many different ways. And so the miracles of Jesus are important to study. Because number one, obviously they confirm his identity. They put his power on play. But also, and this is something I'd never thought about. Although it's quite obvious when the person I was reading said it. Uh, that happens to me a lot, by the way. <laughs> you know, you get to read and you go, well, that makes sense. And um, <clears throat> he said, when you're looking at the miracles of Jesus... And you're looking at individuals many times who have some kind of a physical malady. He said, we live in a fallen world that's all we've ever known. We look at that and we think that's normal because that happens in life. Okay? It's not necessarily the norm in that every person has it, but it's normal in the sense that it's so common we see it and we're not really taken back by it. But what he said was, in God's eyes, that's not normal. Because God didn't create the world to be a place where people were hurt and broken. He created it to be a paradise of Genesis 1 and 2 in which there was complete wholeness in every way. And so when Jesus comes and performs miracles, he's setting things back to the way that God always intended them to be. And he's giving us a glimpse of what heaven will one day be like when all of these maladies are reversed. When we no longer will have them. And so when we study his miracles, he's showing us so many different things. And so tonight, I want us to look at Mark chapter 7. And we have referenced this miraculous healing plenty of times, I'm quite certain, uh, because it's one of my favorite uh, healing interactions that Jesus ever has. All of, them, all of my favorites are found in Mark. Mark 1, the healing of the leper. Uh, Mark chapter 9, the healing of the young man, of the boy that had a demon possession, that had, was possessed by a demon. And his father cries out with tears and says, help my unbelief. And then there's this one in Mark 7, where a deaf and a mute man is healed by Jesus. And uh, there's something so beautiful about the way Jesus, I mean, when you sit back and you really meditate upon the heart of Jesus, it's, it's, it's very overwhelming to see the way he cares for you and the way he cares for me. So... Let's, 
do a couple of things first. First thing we want to do is just kind of give an introduction into Mark very quickly to kind of see what's going on in the book. And then I want us to give an explanation of the text. At that point, we will read the text and, and make comments as we walk through and then close with some points of application. And so first of all, as we move into um, <clears throat> the study and an introduction to Mark, the author itself, the book, well, that's the outline, okay. Uh, the author is John Mark, okay? Uh, that is the John Mark who was so prevalent in the book of Acts. Uh, he was an understudy of Peter. As a matter of fact, many people, many scholars have noticed that when you look at the way that Peter's letters are written, First and Second Peter, and you look at the way Mark is written, obviously they're bigger, but if you were to break them down into an outline structure, John Mark follows the same structure that Peter uses. Okay, And so there's this <clears throat> strong connection there. And really it's interesting that John Mark and Peter were... It's interesting that Peter was John Mark's mentor. Because they were both apparently strong personalities. John Mark's names imply strong, a hammer, strong personality. And Peter, of course, well, all you have to do is read the New Testament and you see his strong personality come out. And so it's interesting, you've got an older man who, who had a trouble keeping himself under control sometimes, was rough and gruff, and by his older age, he's now helping a younger Christian leader to calm himself down and shave off those rough edges and things along those lines. Now, this gospel account has a Roman audience in mind. It doesn't mean that no one else could ever read it and benefit from it, but each one of the gospel accounts are written to a different audience, uh, trying to present Jesus in a way that uh, speaks to their particular situation. So the, the, that's why in <clears throat> Mark's gospel, um, the Romans respected power and authority. And so that's why you see more healings and demon ca casting out of demons in Mark than any other gospel. Um, they were big on service. They were big on... Uh, all of those different things. <clears throat> and so uh, that's what we're looking at here. Now, this gospel begins with the ministry of John the Baptist. Okay? So every gospel account begins differently. Matthew begins going to a genealogy, and then we're introduced to the miraculous appearance of the angel to Joseph, telling him, Don't be afraid to take Mary. Uh, Mark, of course, begins with John the Baptist and his ministry. Uh, Luke begins way back. It's, it's even further back. We're talking to Zacharias and Mary or uh, Elizabeth about the birth of John the Baptist, and then we move forward. John goes even further back and goes into eternity, in, the, in eternity past, to present the gospel. But here <clears throat> um, we have John the Baptist being the first. Uh, and so it begins and it moves very quickly, and that's why Mark... The one of the words, if you use the King James, the word will be straightway. If you use a, a more modern translation, the word will be immediately. Uh, it's very fast. There's no downtime in Mark. It's just constantly moving from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. Okay? And that had to do with the Romans. Now, notice the way this book begins. Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. He says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, what's interesting is we read that, and we read it from a Christian perspective, already with faith in Christ, and we think, well, yeah, that's obvious. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But the original recipients say they, they're sitting in an audience, and they hear this read to them, because you remember uh, paper is not very common in this particular time, and it's expensive, and so the reading of it is where most people will come in contact to it. Now, the word gospel had been used several years before to describe something completely different. Okay, The word gospel, of course, means good news. I want you to listen to this writing, uh, this excerpt from a Roman author uh, concerning the reign of Augustus Caesar. Augustus was Caesar when Jesus was born. It says, Whereas the providence which has ordered the whole of life, showing concern and zeal, has ordained the most perfect consummation... Did I say that? I don't think I, I told you right. Was Augustus emperor when Jesus was born or was it Tiberius? Sorry, that's going to bother me. I've got to look at that. Yes, he was. Tiberius when he crucified. Okay, I was right. Um, <clears throat> so here's a statement about Augustus who was emperor at the time of Jesus' birth. 
Whereas the providence which has ordered the whole of our life, showing concern and zeal, has ordained the most perfect consummation for human life by giving to it Augustus. Okay, So he's saying that human life came into its perfect form when the gods gave the world Augustus. Okay, By filling him, Augustus, with virtue for doing the work of a benefactor among men, by sending him, as it were, a savior for us, and those who come after us to make war cease, to create order everywhere. And whereas the birthday of the God, that is Augustus, was the beginning of the world, of, uh, was the beginning of the word of the glad tidings or gospel that have come to men through him. Augustus was it, man. He unified the empire. War ceased because he controlled them all. He brought prosperity. That's good news. That's gospel. That's a Roman gospel. And Mark says, let me talk to you about a different gospel. Something that's vastly different. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is what real good news is. Not what Augustus can do. And so John Mark is writing with that in mind. And the key text in Mark is Mark 10 and verse 45. When Jesus said, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered or to be, or to be ministered to or served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus came into the world to serve. And we see that on clear display all throughout Mark. He's constantly serving and helping people. It's what characterized his ministry. So as we look now at the book itself, how it is put together, it's broken down into the three years of Jesus' ministry. Um, you have the early Judean ministry, of course, that's the southern area. And then a great chunk of the book is the second year of his, Ga of his Galilean ministry. And then uh, the third year in chapters 10 through 16, his later Judean ministry, he returns and that leads to the crucifixion and things along those lines. Now, as we kind of narrow down even further and we think about this chapter in chapter 7, so chapter 7 is probably most well known in Mark for its debate concerning walk, eating with unwashed hands. And Jesus goes against their traditions. Okay, And so, in vain you worship me teaching us doctrines the commandments of men. You've created your own ordinances that have to be followed that God never created. And so, <clears throat> it begins with a debate with the Pharisees. Now, that then leads to Jesus kind of withdrawing and departing to Phoenicia, which you remember is on, from our Wednesday night studies, that's Tyre and Sidon. That's that northern, northwestern part of Israel along the coastline of the Mediterranean. Okay, So he departs there and kind of takes, he doesn't take a break, but he takes a break from public ministry being the main focus. He's kind of taking a break to be with his disciples and develop them. Okay, so what Jesus will do a lot of times in his ministry, he'll spend an extended period of time in the public, helping people and letting the disciples watch. And then other times he will kind of withdraw for a few days and just talk to the disciples or the apostles alone and kind of grow them and develop them that way. And so he's on one of those particular things <clears throat> as he's on a, a training, I guess you might say, with the disciples. And then you have him uh, in the Decapolis, which is where this takes place. Now, if you have a map in the back of your Bible... Uh, you'll be able to locate Decapolis quite easily. Look for the map of Israel in the times of Jesus. Go up to the top where the Sea of Galilee is and then go right. And there's the Decapolis. And you can hear it in the term what it is. Deca is 10. Even though I hate math, I know that. Deca is 10. Polis is city. So it's an area of 10 cities. Okay, The Decapolis. Uh, it's many times referred to in scripture. And so they go into that particular region which is not predominantly Israelite region. Okay? It's going to have a number of Gentiles in that particular region. And so that brings us to where we are in Mark chapter 7. And <clears throat> we will look at here in just a moment, this map hopefully will make a little more sense. Although uh, Phoenicia, you can see up here at the very top, is to the left. And then the Decapolis, you can see the region here. There's uh, the Sea of Galilee at the, at the top. And then the Decapolis is kind of sketched off for you there. And it runs into Perea in the south. So <clears throat> this is where Jesus is as we meet him in our text. So verse 31, he does something quite interesting here. It says, Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee, 
in uh, the region of the Decapolis. Now, here's why this is interesting, and I just remember I've got a better pointer up here. So, um, <clears throat> this is why this, this particular text is interesting, okay? So, <clears throat> it says, He returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee. Well, it's not working either, so we'll be okay. So, if you'll notice Tyre, Sidon is at the very, very top, almost cut off of this map. Tyre is just below it. Now, if I want to go to the Decapolis, which you can see is right here, why would I go north to Sidon and then come all the way around to Decapolis? It seems to be out of the way, doesn't it? Okay. <clears throat> Now, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Some people believe that he was trying to avoid the territory that was ruled by one of the Herods uh, and some hostility that existed there. You could also read it as Jesus going out of his way to meet individual people who had needs. That's not something unseen in Scripture. In Acts chapter 8, you have Philip having a great revival down in Samaria, and then what does God have him do? He has him go meet one person, a nobleman riding in a chariot. He's just as concerned with the single individual as he is with the great multitudes in revival. And so it could be that Jesus is coming for this particular reason into this place. And so that leads us then, number two, to our person who is going to need the help of Jesus. It says, they brought to him a man who was deaf. And he had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. All right? So they, that is, it seems, the crowds brought a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. Now, those two things are, are obviously going to kind of go hand in hand. Right? One of the ways we learn to speak is by hearing it. We hear words. We kind of develop. That's, that's how we grow. Uh, that's how we develop in our language. <clears throat> and so the fact that he is deaf, he can't hear those words. Now, I'm going to take a shot in the dark and say sign language probably didn't exist at the time. And if it did, it was probably in a very primitive form. And so communication was extremely difficult. And uh, so when they look at him, now you have to remember that America has taken great strides of ending the stigma of, certain, of, of a person having disabilities, right? Even down to the names that we use to describe the uh, whether you want to call them a handicap or um, uh, whatever it may be, we've worked really hard to get to that point. But even in parts of the world today, that doesn't exist. Um, <clears throat> for an example, just to give you an illustration, I was reading a book recently of a man, well, not recently, about a year or two ago, but he was in the Himalayan mountains. And he was out trying to evangelize in those mountains. And I'll never forget what what he said as long as I live because the image is just haunting and he said we went into a village and uh, in a barn they had a young boy of 12 years of age chained to the wall because they believed that he had a demon he had cerebral palsy but they didn't know what it was So you have to understand <clears throat> the way people see this. And so when they bring him to Jesus, we already know that a common thought in that day really was that if something like that, if some kind of physical malady, if, you, if, if there was a, deform a deformity or if you, you, know, you couldn't speak or you were deaf, that that had to mean that either you were a sinner or your parents were sinners. So they're basically bringing this person to Jesus saying, can you fix him? It, it may not even necessarily be something that's just wildly compassionate. But I want you to think about the way this man must have felt ostracized his whole life. Um, just put out to the margins and uh, really reduced to begging. I mean, there are no health care, there's no uh, governmental programs in place to help him eat. So, I mean, he's desperate. He's um, about as low as, as you could go in this particular <clears throat> society. 
So they bring him to Jesus. Then Jesus performs his miracle. Now I want you to watch the way Jesus interacts with him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and later spitting touched his tongue. So let's talk for a minute here. First of all, he takes him aside from the crowd privately. Why does he do that? Why does he take him to the side? I don't know for certain, but I have a decent idea. And that is that sometimes when you see a person, when we, when we interact with people with physical maladies or handicaps or whatever you choose to, to refer to them to, we have a tendency of conflating their issue with the person. We make them the same. Right? So <clears throat> one of my close friends in a place that I preached uh, was in his later 50s, mid to late 50s, when he was diagnosed with cancer. He ended up dying from it several years later. But uh, <clears throat> when I would go and see him, some people would ask, well, how's he doing? And I would be honest with him and say, I really can't tell you. I don't know what the doctors have said. Because when I walked into his room, the only th he was an Alabama football fan. The only thing I talked to him about was Alabama football. And the reason I did that was his entire existence, since he had gotten cancer, it's like Drew became cancer. That's the only thing people associated with him anymore. It's like he stopped being Drew and he just became cancer. And what I wanted to do when I went to see him was to remind him that he was not a disease that was ravaging his body. He was still himself. And so when you have an individual like this who's been ostracized their whole life, that been referred to as the deaf person, you know, the one that can't speak, and no individual attention being given to them, and Jesus pulls him. He's been a public spectacle his whole life, and now Jesus is going to treat him with the dignity and respect he deserves and give him one-on-one -on -one time. There's something incredibly beautiful about that. About how Jesus takes the individual where he is. Then, it says he put his fingers in his ears and after spitting he touched his tongue. Now I've got to be honest with you, for a long time when I would read this text, that was just a little confusing to me. I, I just kind of wondered what he was doing. I mean, why put your fingers in his ear and spit? He didn't spit in his tongue. He spit and then he touched his tongue. Okay? Those... The, <laughs> So just kind of back up on that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so what he's doing is he's basically communicating to him in a, in a type of sign. Okay? So he's, he's off to the side, and he's got him away. And so putting his fingers in his ears, he's communicating to him about his ears. You can't hear. I'm going to do something. I'm, I'm talking to you. I'm, I'm here to help you with this. And then spitting. And spitting <clears throat> in a lot of these cultures had association with the divine. Uh, as far as it being able uh, to have some kind of a healing process. Okay? And so with the spitting and then touching his tongue, he's communicating saying, I'm here to help you with this. And this. Do you see Jesus? He's just as delicate as delicate can be with this guy. Then, <clears throat> in verse 34, and looking up to heaven, he sighed. He sighed. He identified with him. He felt his pain. He sighed because this is not the way that God intended the world to be. There's this sense of frustration of what sin has done to the world. There's this sense of, of anger, of feeling the pain of this man. And it's interesting, you know, when we see a person with their difficulties and we hear about some of their difficulties, we kind of, we can go through an emotional exercise where we kind of put ourselves in their shoes and try and see what, 
you know, the struggles they would have had because they had this or something along those lines. And we can do that to a degree, and that's a good exercise. But Jesus is able to do that to the fullest degree. Jesus could, in a moment, experience everything in that man's life, every hurt, every pain, every, every time he was ostracized. He could feel that. He identified with his hurt. And then he said, Ephatha, Aramaic term, that's why it's translated, that is, be opened. Be opened. And his ears were opened, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Now he can hear, and now he can speak plainly, orthos. You go to an orthodontist to do what? So they can straighten your teeth. He spoke plainly. Now what's interesting is, <clears throat> if you study even uh, an introduction, say, I, I don't know if a, an introduction to biology would do this, I know an introduction to psychology, in one of your textbooks you'll learn about what the brain does and its connection, you'll learn about the development of language. And one of the things that, that struck me when I was reading in that textbook a few years ago was this occasion, this account, because even if a person could have their, their, their ears restored to the sense that they could hear, they would still have to go through a long process of therapy of loosening their tongue and getting it and being able to speak correctly. If we could do it, it would still be a long process. Jesus does it and he hears and he speaks perfectly. There's no other process. It's just immediate. He speaks so plainly. Then in verse 36, Jesus charged him to tell no one. You know, sometimes we're troubled by Jesus telling people not to tell anyone about him. Well, you have to remember that Jesus' primary purpose on earth was not to perform miracles. It was to preach and teach. And what we can see from places like John 6 and others is that a lot of people looked at Jesus as kind of like a carnival worker. He can perform these miracles. Let's come see the great Jesus. Pull back the curtain and let's watch him make things disappear. Almost like a magic. Jesus was more concerned with preaching. Okay? And so that's why he would say many times, don't go and tell everybody because I don't want this to turn into some kind of a circus show and, I, and therefore I won't be able to preach and accomplish the mission that I have here. But then you have in verse 36, and this always happens, but the more he charged him, the more zealously he proclaimed it. The more zealously he proclaimed it. He couldn't keep it in. He told everyone. And listen, I'm not justifying what the man did here. He obviously violated what Jesus said. But i got to be honest with you. I'd rather be in his shoes than in the shoes of another individual who has experienced the grace of Jesus and God has told us to tell everyone about the amazing grace we've experienced and then we sit on our hands and we don't ever do that. I would much rather be this person than that person. So you can understand where he's coming from. Then in verse 37, you see the effect on the crowd. And they were astonished beyond measure. Literally, their minds were blown out, is what the word means. Their minds were blown out. And they, and <clears throat> beyond measure, saying, this is what the crowd said, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Now, this phrase, this statement, He has done all things well, it seems like they're referencing Genesis chapter 1. You remember at the end of creation, Genesis 131, God looked at everything and He said, Behold, it is very good. There seems to be this echo back to Eden when they say this. He's, do, he's done all things well. The deaf are hearing and the mute are speaking. Which, by the way, is a reference to another Old Testament text. Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame men leap like deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Or as Charles Wesley wrote in the song, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And he talks about in, I think, the third or fourth verse of that song, you blind, behold your Savior come and leap you lame for joy. 
he opens up the ear. He's he's using Isaiah 35. He's using Mark chapter 7 as he writes that song where God is restoring things back to the way that they should be. All right, so here's Jesus. A lot more could be said here, but we'll leave it there. Let's look at a couple points of application that build on each other. So when we look at this text, the first thing that we see is that Jesus takes time for us. Now remember we said that it seems like Jesus is most likely on a teaching retreat with his disciples. That is, his main emphasis is upon these 12 men, helping them. But then a man is brought to him in need, and what does he do? He interrupts his purpose. And he helps a person in need. Now for a lot of people... And for a long time, well, not a long time, but in the early years when I was preaching, I had my things that I had to get done, and I didn't really like interruptions, right? I was there, I had things that needed to be done, and that was it. But one of the things you have to come to realize is that people and their needs are not interruptions. They're the reason that you exist. They're the reason that you do what you do. And that a person who comes in and, quote, interrupts what you're doing may be a divine interruption of God saying, I'm laying it right in front of you. Serve a person. Help someone. But what's interesting is Jesus, he stops what he's doing. He takes time for it. And the thing that we need to understand is that Jesus takes time for us. He takes time for us. Jesus is never too busy to help us or to be with us. So when we study, when we pray, he's always there. We never have to wonder when we're praying, I wonder if Jesus is really listening. I wonder if Jesus is giving me any attention. Or is he just kind of like, yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. Okay, get it over with. Or spit it out. Say what you need to say. That's not Jesus. He is the most compassionate. Focus on a single individual being that there is. He invests himself so fully in that individual. It's not an interruption when we go to him. It's what he desires most. Number two, along those lines... Jesus interacts individually with us. He doesn't just take time for us, but he interacts with us individually. Okay? He doesn't say, okay, this is what's going to happen. When y'all come together, I want all of y'all to pray together, and I'll deal with you all in bulk. He takes every individual in this room, when we come to him, it's as if we're the only person in the world. He's taking that kind of time for us. Hebrews 7 and verse 25 says that he lives, that is that he continues to live, talking about his priesthood as an eternal priesthood because he does not die. And so since he always lives, he makes intercession for us. He talks to God about us. I don't know about you, but that's just hard for me to wrap my mind around. It is hard for me to wrap my mind around the fact that Jesus talks to the Father about me and that he calls my name. I don't doubt it in any way. It's just hard to wrap your head around. But he does. When you hurt, when I hurt, Jesus talks to the Father about us. Number three, Jesus understands us. He pulled this man to the side and he understood him. He understood him. Jesus felt his pain. He sighed deeply with him. Jesus feels our pain today. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 is one of the most fundamental texts to 
really a, a, understanding our devotional life with Christ. Um, that is, we have a great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, who's passed in the heavens. Uh, <clears throat> we don't have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Or some translations will say, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He understands what it's like to be us. And therefore, because he's in heaven with the Father, and he understands what it's like to be us, therefore, we come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Jesus understands how I feel. He understands that. As much as I may not think that to be true, it's true. He understands what it means to hurt. He understands it at every single level. As he showed it. Listen, if Jesus will take an ostracized, deaf, and mute man in the backwoods of Palestine... 2,000 years ago, and we'll give him individual attention, who are we to believe that he won't take individuals in a small town in Alabama and give them the same type of individual attention? Who are we to believe that? He feels for us. And then he not only feels for us, you know, a lot of times we can be there for people and we can feel for people, we can listen to them, and try and help them in that way. But at the end of the day, we may not be able to really help fix their problem. But Jesus can. And that's the point where he helps our hurts. He healed this man that everybody thought was a lost cause. Nothing's ever going to become of him. He's just doomed to lead this type of an existence. And Jesus meets him and he completely changes his life. And Jesus is with us and he helps us in our own hurts throughout the day. Now here's the thing we have to keep in mind. He may not heal my hurts in the way that I may think about it. If I'm sick, I may not get better. Okay? That's just the ugly reality of it. Part of living in a fallen world, we can't live forever. So if I'm sick, I may not get better. But one thing we know for certain is one day he's going to ultimately heal every hurt and he's going to right every wrong. Death will not be permanent. It will be reversed. All of the, the maladies that we might have struggled with health-wise on this earth will no longer be existent in the next. And so he's telling us through these miracles to hold on. I will walk with you through the midst of your grief, through the midst of your difficulties, through the midst of your hurts and your struggles. And if you will trust me, I'm telling you, this stuff is going away. I've given you every reason to believe me. I'm going to end this. This will not happen anymore. That's Jesus. And man, he's so incredibly and so incredibly beautiful. The way he, he treats people. And as we saw this morning, as a holy God who treats a sinful people, we're not any different than the man that he healed. And tonight, if somebody is struggling with their hurts, maybe it's the hurt of sin, Never come to him. Initially, there is no condition you can be in that God would ever look at you and say, mm, no, not going to take you. That condition does not exist. If you will, by penitent faith, come to him, believe and repent of your sins and confess Christ and to be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, he receives you. Or maybe as New Testament Christians, <clears throat> we have not been who we should be, or maybe, and more focused on, on what we're talking about tonight, maybe I'm just struggling with life. And it happens to everybody. 
uh, we would be more than happy. Happy may not even, is not a strong enough word. But we would be more than happy to sit with you, to listen to you, to help you any way that we could. And if that's something that you feel comfortable with us talking about together and praying together as a collective group in this moment, or if that's something where we go in private and sit and pray about it in that particular location, we're happy to do that as well. And so if we can help you tonight, let us know as we stand and sing this song. Thank <clears throat> you.